in one. I'm a heart that breaks for a dying city. Stop cursing your future. <laughs> is not true. For all intents and purposes, I am a woman. The government and political system has ultimate supremacy. Jesus is king of kings, and it's about time our nation returned in humble submission to his lordship. You are not protecting women. You are authorizing the destruction of 500,000 little women every year. I didn't start, but sir, sir, with all due respect, that's the argument of a five-year-old. I didn't start it. Right, when the spirit comes upon people, they go to war, they go to battle, and the enemies of God are driven back, and they're slaughtered. You are listening to Cross Politic with Gabe Wrench, the water boy, Pastor Toby Sumter, and the Chocolate Knox. Welcome, Fight Left Feast family. Good to be with you. For those who aren't here, we're coming at you live from Phoenix, Arizona, or is this Scott's, Scott, Scottsdale? Found Hills. Okay, all right. Phoenix, Arizona. <laughs> it's all the same. Uh, of course, we got Pastor Toby, Chalk Knox, I'm the water boy. We got Dr. White. Jeff Durbin and Delano Squire is also here with us. If you guys, if you, you guys already kind of know the good doctor. I mean, this everybody guy, knows who this, James this White guy. is. Where's my commercial ad copy? You know, you know what? I gotta read commercials, right? That's why I'm here. To read, to read, to read my commercial oh, soul. Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. Thank you. That's, that's the only <laughs> that reason I'm here. That's, <laughs> that's why he agreed to come on the show. <laughs> <laughs> they, they they said they've they've been needing somebody for a long time. You, you stop that. <laughs> I stop you it. stop that. Toby's feeling threatened. So this is. Uh, I missed one show. Doctor White reads my ads, and now he thinks he's got my job. <laughs> he did a good job, though. <laughs> <laughs> you you, you, you hey, got to take the job. You got to take the job. You're gonna side with him? He won't. Here's the thing. He won't do it for himself. Oh. He won't do it for his own show or his own ministry. Oh, yeah. But, but he'll do it for others. He does a great job. He's a good radio voice. He's fine stealing a brother's that's, job. That's of course. And of course, give a warm, warm welcome to Jeff Durbin, pastor of Apologia and Abortion Woo. Now. We got two pastors of Apologia yeah, here now. Yeah. yeah. Everybody knew Doctor. I mean, I, I guess everybody knows Jeff, too. What are we doing tonight? Oh, we're going to get there. We, we thought we were coming to debate Shh. baptism. <laughs> <laughs> what do you guys say? We just, well, you know that's going to come up. And baptize your believers. Say? We make this that's swerve right. a little bit. <laughs> you can moderate. James and I are ready. Let's do it. All right. I mean, baby, no, I baby baptism is one of the tools of liberty. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Can All I right. get an amen? It's on. <laughs> All right. And then, of course, uh, give a warm welcome to our buddy, Delano Squires. Yeah. yeah. He uh, literally flew in this morning from uh, Washington, D.C., from the, the, the swamp. Yep. And, and then he actually flies out tonight to go back home because he's got some business to, to get back to. Um, but if Just you don't know Delano, <laughs> if you don't know Delano, he's a homeschool dad, contributor at Fearless with Jason Whitlock, along with Chocolate Knox, uh, CEO of Civitas Group, and he's a scholar at 1776 Unites. That's his Twitter bio. <laughs> yes. Works Woo. for me. <laughs> Works for you. And I follow him on Twitter. I do too. And, and of course, you, you guys already know uh, David Reese, Armor Republic. Uh, he's one of the sponsors of this city tour stop, and uh, actually a couple of our city tour stops. Yeah. Give him a round of a hand. Yep. Thank you, David. Thank you, Armor Republic. And of course, uh, Scott, uh, uh, Chris. Uh, from Stratech, uh, he's also uh, he owns the ranch. He's he's opening his house up to us. So please give uh, Chris a warm welcome and a round of applause to Shotgun. Hey, 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 I gotta make one more introduction. This is the first time I ever got to do this. Okay. My mom and dad are here. Oh, that's right. Right over there. There they are. Hi, mom. Raise Love your you, hand. Love you, mom. Love you, dad. Mr. and Mr. Something, thank you guys so much for this blessing. Appreciate y'all. Yeah, you know, I, I, when, when we started, I think we pretty much thought it was only going to be our moms listening. Well, for a while, <laughs> but that was all that was. And I think she was. She was among the first fans. But uh, anyways, thank you, Mom and Dad, for being here. Yeah. yeah. There you go. Well, so we've been on this kind of three-city Liberty Tour. I already mentioned we were in Dallas-Fort Worth. We were in uh, Rapid City in April yeah. and now Phoenix here. And, and it is because of David Reese that we're particularly here. He said, he said, I want you guys to come. And so that's why we're here in Phoenix, Arizona. And plus, our boys in the backyard of, of the Apologia crew, we wanted to, to come with those guys um, too. And uh, part of this Liberty Tour, you know, COVID happened in 2020. 
a lot of things were exposed. I think a lot of our eyes were open to uh, where our weaknesses were as a church, as a family, as a business. And so we wanted to kind of go on this Liberty Tour to kind of um, ho- hopefully strengthen family, strengthen individuals, strengthen the church on how to think about what true liberty is. And that's, a, uh, I mean, I think it's never been more important to think this way. Um, you know, how do, how do we not get moved by the right or the left? The right, the left is, their hair's on fire. The right's kind of apathetic. How do we not let them push us? How do we get to the heart of what Christian liberty is? We want to define what liberty is. We don't want the left defining what liberty is, because that means killing 60 million babies a year. And we don't want the right defining what liberty is, because they have no basis. They've left their, the left, the right has left their basis of what liberty, Christian liberty truly is. Conservatives have unhitched the Bible from their conservatism, which means modern conservatism is suspended in the air. That's where we're at. Amen. Modern Republicans have suspended their conservatism in the air, disconnected from scriptures, and that means it's easily influenced by the prevailing winds. This is how we got Trump. <laughs> they were easily influenced by it. Now, now Trump had some, uh, some characteristics that we all wanted. You know, Trump was finally fighting, which is some Republicans refused to do for the last 20 years. That's how we got Bush. Um, because conservatism is detached from the truth, truth, uh, conservatives can't build anything right now. Because we've detached conservatism from the truth, we can't build. This is why, to David's point, to David Reese's point, we went and worked for Microsoft. We went and worked for Bezos. We went and worked for all these big companies. We helped the liberals build the, this economy that we're in right now. And they hate us. And they right. hate you. Yeah. <laughs> And, and for that matter, Fox News hates you. Yeah. You know, Sean Hannity goes and interviews Bruce Jenner and at no point gave a horse laugh. The king walked into Sean Hannity's interview with no clothes on and Sean Hannity said, you got nice clothes on today. Yeah. That's Fox News. Yeah. Right? So conservatism is not creating culture. It does not inspire a people to move, to act, and to follow. This is how, again, like I said earlier, he got, we got Trump. He inspired. He brought together a movement. He was a fighter. Um, but cer- certainly wasn't a biblical conservatism that Trump was pushing. So we need to unwind decades of giving our liberties, decades of giving our responsibilities to others. We, for Conservatives for decades have been given our responsibilities to the public school system. We've been given our responsibilities to the liberals. We've been, we've been dishing it out. And like David said, if you take responsibility, you will get more responsibility. And so we want to map out, tonight we want to map out a tangible vision and actionable steps to be truly free and to build a truly free city. That's what we want, a truly free community, a truly free city. For far too long, and this is part of the, you know, both liberals and conservatives at some level look at the federal government as their God for different reasons. Facts. And so for far too long, hey, make sure Knox's mic is up. I don't think it's very loud. And you're deaf. And, Don't forget you're deaf. So. And, uh, and I'm deaf in one ear. And make sure his monitor maybe is a little up. It might just be me. I'm deaf in one ear. <laughs> um, but, but for far too long, all our energy has been put into electing the next president. In Moscow, Idaho, I live in, we live in, we live in a highly conservative state in Idaho. And so where the elections really matter is at the primaries. Our primaries just happen in May. That's where the elections really matter. But guess what? Only 30% of Republicans show up and vote in the primaries. And then that primary determines who runs the state for the next four years. And only 30% are getting involved. Only 30% are active. When a presidential election year comes around, you get 70%. You get 65, you know, maybe 70%. And if there's enough fraud, you might get 75%. (laughs) But that's because we've looked at the conservatives and their angle on this. They've looked at the federal government as their savior when we should have been building true, free cities. And so that's what we want to map out tonight. Yeah. So, Toby, I'm going to hand it over to you to start getting into one, number one. Well, we call this, I I want to introduce, I'm actually going to tell everybody up front where we're going to go. So we 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 call this five stones of liberty, five five smooth stones of liberty, because we got some giants to take down in the land. So these are our five smooth stones, um, and we're going to walk through each one of them. The first one is the centrality of worship. 
The second one is confession of sin. The third one is discipleship. The fourth one is taking responsibility. And the fifth one is building anti-fragile communities. So we're going to walk through each one of those and, and want to talk through um, how these things are actually about building free cities, free communities. Uh, because for far too long, as Gabe said, we are constantly just reacting. Oh, whoa. Speaking of reacting, looks good. <laughs> Uh, we're constantly reacting to the fires that, that the leftists are starting rather than starting our own fires. And so this is exactly what David Reese was talking about earlier. Uh, we need to be on the offensive, not constantly on the defensive. And this is the way you build true uh, liberty. So I want to start with the centrality of worship. Yeah. And um, which again is something that frequently people don't think. They don't, they don't think like, I want to be free. I want this to be a free nation. So um, I should make sure that I'm worshiping God faithfully. Uh, but I, I was actually reminded of this this morning, uh, this, uh, a guy I follow on Twitter, um, Anthony Bradley. Um, he, uh, he tweets, he shares this article. Wait, wait, you haven't been blocked by him? No. <laughs> then you're a nobody. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I've been blocked by him for so long as I, I can't yeah, even remember. Well, yeah. anyways, I'll, I'll, let me show you what he's doing on Twitter. Thank you. Uh, um, he's, uh, so you know. He shares this article um, about a school in Georgia, a high school in Georgia, where uh, uh, high school students have been uh, disciplined, and then I think they're now suing uh, the high school because the high school students were wearing uh, Black Lives Matter T-shirts. Uh, on campus, which is apparently they've banned like political speech or something like that. However, uh, at the same Georgia high school, it is perfectly permissible uh, to wear shirts with Confederate flags on them. And, um, and so, and, and Anthony Bradley's comment was, uh, the idolatry runs deep. Now, I don't know all that he meant by that, and I'm not even sure I would completely agree with his read on it, Maybe I would, maybe I wouldn't. But the thing that I thought was interesting about that was that he instinctively thought this is about worship. He was once quite conservative. Which, yeah, but, but, yeah, but, I, but I'm just thinking in terms of, so he's thinking what's driving this is a kind of worship. Mm -hmm. what, what you, uh, what, one thing we need to remember and have re-ingrained in our minds is that um, you become like what you worship. Right. This is Psalm 115 says that, um, that the idols of the nations have eyes but can't see, hands but can't touch, feet can't do nothing, mouths but can't speak. And then it says, all those who make them become like them. If you serve idols, you become deaf, dumb, and blind, like your idols. But if you serve the living God, you become more human. You're given back your sight. You're given, you right. become right. a human again. And again, that's what we mean by freedom. So my, my question I want to kick to you guys is, so in what ways have you seen um, this play out? I mean, is, is, is worship, I mean, how central is it? I'm claiming it, like, if you don't have worship right, uh, we're, we're, I'm saying you're, you're, you're going to be, if you don't worship Jesus, you're worshiping idols, and that will necessarily lead to tyranny. Last week in Louisiana, it was all about worship. Amen. Mm -hmm. The whole yeah. thing was about worship. That's right. Every aspect of it. It's hard to express if you weren't there. Everyone on the ground knows what I'm talking about. What happened there last week was all about worship. I think one of the things that was so difficult for the legislators to overcome in Louisiana was the fact that the church was actually inundating legislators with phone calls saying, obey Jesus Christ, obey God's word, keep your commitments to God. You profess to be a believer. You profess to believe this. Do your duty before God. Obey Jesus. Obey God rather than men. That's what they were getting as an onslaught of phone calls and emails was encouragement. I'm praying for you. Obey Jesus. Obey God's word. Do your duty and protect these children. That's what they were getting for a week after it passed the hearing stage. And we get to the Capitol. And while we're in the Capitol, I think something happened there. I mean, first of all, the whole thing was historic. To get a bill of equal protection that calls what's in the womb in the image of God deserving equal protection from the moment of conception is itself in, in one sense historic, but we've gotten those into other states across the country, but it, they never allowed it to go to hearing stage or pass hearing stage. This was historic. In 50 years since Roe, we got a bill, a Christian bill, 
that acknowledges the word of God, that uses God's standards, that says equal protection for all humans. We got it into the hearing. It passed the hearing overwhelmingly, seven to, seven to two. It gets to the floor. And while we were there, I think the legislators were struggling so deeply and profoundly because they were told that week after the hearing by the pro-life establishment, do not pass this bill. We do not believe that she's guilty of anything. We don't want it to be criminal. We're not looking for equal protection. They were, they were inundated with Christians calling saying, obey Jesus Christ and the establishment saying, don't pass this bill. We don't think she's guilty. Including the ERLC. I don't Absolutely. know if you saw that. Absolutely. Yeah. That was all in response. This national letter that went out from 70 pro-life organizations to every state legislature in the country was in response to our bill. It was because of what happened from the church in Louisiana. So when I say our bill, I don't mean Jeff Durbin's bill. I don't mean end abortion now's bill. Yes, we're, we're at the front fighting from the front, but it's the, it's the, this is the church's work. This is the church of Jesus Christ, Presbyterians and Baptists. We even had Charismatics and Arminians all saying the same thing, standing on the same standard. Kind of like the CREC. Yeah, it was, yeah. So, so here's, you, here's... You should join. I'm going to give you a picture of it, a portrait. You've got to hear this because it was historic. This was where that... Uh, that opening to the Capitol was filled up with Christians, and it's online. You can see it on Apologia Studios. <clears throat> you had Christians from a, just a broad spectrum of Christian denominations inside the Capitol worshiping Jesus so loud that the sing singing was, was going throughout the entire Capitol. Wow. And the legislators were so wrecked by this that they were begging people to send us to stop mm. because wow. all they heard was the church worshiping in the Capitol, praising Jesus. I mean, a mighty fortress is our God. I mean, that had never happened before. And so this historic moment, they knew that this is coming from the church and that these people are saying, obey God rather than men. Mm. And when we talk about the centrality of everything as, as worship, you've got the church in this instance saying, this is all about Christ and his lordship and the law of God, and you must obey Jesus and yield to his authority above anything else. And the bill even said that. You will, this is the image of God, you will protect it, that's your duty. And if anybody tries to subvert that protection, you will ignore them mm. because you must obey God rather than men. And so what's interesting is that the, the, the difference in gods was seen on the floor That's right. that the church was saying, obey God. Mm -hmm. Our legislator said this is murder. He was quoting scripture and he was talking about this needing to be ended, abolished, criminalized. And he was doing it as a Christian and they all knew that. But the other legislators who were then convinced to oppose the bill, their entire argument was essentially rested on <clears throat> the Supreme Court has said... The supreme Man. being has ruled. Yep. And so we must yield to our God. What is worship? Yep. It's at minimum glory and sacrifice. Right. You are giving weight to, you are saying you are, you are everything. I glory in you. I'm giving you all the weight and you're sacrificing. And so what they, what was on full display in, in Louisiana is the real issue is who gets the glory and who are we going to sacrifice to? That's right. Right. For the Christians, yes, they were saying, you must do this because Jesus Christ, for the ones who were subverting it and resisting it, they were saying, we will yield to a different authority. Right. We will yield to another. And the amazing thing was, was the tension, the tension that existed within those in the legislature who were professing to believe and love the Lord Jesus Christ. There was such a difficult angst. I, I spent the whole week there looking at legislators who profess faith in Christ with tears falling from their eyes, begging us to pull the bill. Mm. begging us because they said, we know that it's right. It has to be done. We know, but please not now. Now is not the time. Mm. Wow. And so it really, really came down to is I was saying, obey God rather than men. Obey. That was all of it. It was simple. Yeah. I don't even and know. And asking what, the question, who is God? Exactly. Right? Has so, God said? So there's an, there's an instance there in terms of liberty. We're talking about the liberty of the preborn. These are image bearers of God, their liberty, protecting their freedom. What did it all come down to? It came down to a question of ultimate. Who's the ultimate here? Who has the final word and say, and what will you worship and serve? Will it be the people? Is it going to be Demas? Is it going to be the supreme being of the United States? Or will it be Jesus Christ? Will you honor and obey him and yield to him? And there you have such a practical, practical, up close and personal uh, uh, illustration of the point. Worshiping idols, 
disfigures human beings. Yeah, that's right. It, it, it deforms them. It destroys them. It, it completely, I mean, that's what abortion does. And part of it, like you said earlier, Pastor, worship is inescapable. You're going to worship, right? Yeah. But then it also comes with law. So worship ultimately defines reality. Right. And when you define reality, you say this creates human flourishing <laughs> and this doesn't. So you're doing that both ways. And ultimately what they're saying is this is the kind of human flourishing that we're willing to deal with, which is not human flourishing at all. And so everybody is, is do, doing worship. Yeah. And we are, it seems like as Christians, particularly as conservatives, we're scared to start with liberty as worship because we don't think, we think somehow we can have some sort of human flourishing apart from defining who the God of the system is. Right. You, got, you got guys like David French saying, who's a professing Christian, yeah. reformed Christian, PCA member, saying that drag queen story hour is just the price of living in a free society. Well, he, he, he said, he didn't say it was the price. He said it's a blessing of liberty. What? Mm. <laughs> that was, those were his words. And, and, I, and I think it just shows that just because someone says that they're conservative and says that they're Christian does not necessarily mean that they're reasoning from Scripture. So, yeah. so to me, when I, when I think about worship, even in the context of family, I think about basically six decades of, of a nation worshiping mammon telling women that their highest and best use is to serve corporations mm. and to leave the, the raising and training of their children to the state. Amen. Um, and, and in that, what, what you know, uh, going along with that particular type of worldview and mindset, men have done the same. And they've said, you know what? You go out and work, honey. You, you help build that man's corporation Right. Um, you help manage right. his office, you know, we'll give our education over to the state. And, and I think in doing that, we, we've seen what, you know, we've been reaping that, that fruit for a long time. And, and I, I thank God, one of the blessings of, of COVID, and I don't mean to, to minimize it, obviously a lot of people lost their lives, is that you started to see an increase in homeschooling. And you see parents taking back the authority that God has given them. Yeah. And you see the state You're not going to give them an organ? I'm just saying amen. <laughs> I'm over here. I'm, I got my hands full. But yeah, amen. So, and, and, and you see the state saying, we're not, we're not giving this over quietly. So we are trying as, as believers, as Christians, to hold to and reestablish the, the order that God created before the foundation of this world. And the state is saying... I'm not going to let you go that easily. Right. But, but ultimately, we are free people and we need to live like free people. Amen. 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 <laughs> he know what to do with that, too. I know he know what to do with that. <laughs> Come on. Dr. White, I saw you grab your mic in the middle of what he was saying. I know you got something to say. I just... I, I, I think what needs to be... Everyone needs to really grasp hold of and understand... When we think of the idolatry that the early church faced in the Roman Empire, that is a form of paganism that is superior to the form we're facing today. And we sometimes struggle with that because we figure, oh, we're, we're so much more enlightened and so on and so forth. No. We are literally, when people, if people just by mistake turned this on, you know, clicked on something wrong, yeah. walked out of the room, came back, and we're playing. Okay, uh, yeah. they're going, and they listened to your opening. They are so disconnected; they are really wondering what planet you beamed down from. Mm -hmm. Because while the pagan Roman would have understood the authority structures and the idea of man that lay behind what you were saying, we are now watching people that Joe Biden is appointing to various positions of power. And we listen to the bankruptcy of their worldview and the idiocy of their responses. And we go, how can that be? It can be because we are now reaping the full whirlwind of a secular mindset that doesn't just have paganism, doesn't just have idolatry. It rips mankind apart to such a point that ev you even have to define for these people 
yeah. what worship is, mm -hmm. what idolatry is, because they live in a random universe without a God, without any order, without any meaning. They don't even have the tools to put together the words we're using. Yeah. That is, the, that is what we are facing in our society. Right. And we struggle, especially if we're speaking Christianese. We all know what all these words mean. We have the connected you know, way of, of, of defining words. But we are literally talking to people now that their faces become blank. Mm -hmm. And I, it's, it's a spiritual thing. It's a major spiritual thing. But the reality is we have to recognize that and we have to, as we talked on the program today, pursue them mm -hmm. and pursue the image of God that is in them. That's right. And get them back to the point of recognizing that they someday will stand before a holy God to be judged for the deeds done in the body. Right. That is so far from our current generation that it's considered absolute mythology of your childhood. <laughs> Yep, but we yep. have got to get that back into right. the center of what we're saying. Sure. And here's the thing. We're servants of the king. And so we worship the way God calls us to worship. We don't worship the way the world calls us to worship. We don't sacrifice babies in our worship. Jesus was sacrificed for us. And one of the things that um, we want to speak practically about what worship is. We, wanna, um, we want you guys to walk away with a, a vision of what biblical worship looks like. There's, a, there's definitely a sense in which... You know, all of life is worship. There's a sense in which David Reese said earlier, um, you ought to have family worship. You ought to have personal, private worship. Um, also, um, gather together with God's saints on the Lord's Day uh, for worship. And well, some of the terminology you probably heard us use before comes from our Pastor Wilson, where worship is warfare. And so if worship is warfare, um, then there's a organization to what that warfare looks like in the church. And uh, we like to use the, the kind of the five C's of worship, the five C's of worship. And, and so when you come to visit maybe one of our CREC churches or come to visit our churches, we're largely kind of structured around um, uh, this kind of um, Old Testament structure of what it looked like and how we kind of import that into the New Testament. And so the five C's of worship are um, a call to worship. So when you come into church, you hear a call to worship. It's time to worship. Get ready. We're, we're worshiping the Lord your God now. The second C is confession. You got to clean your feet off at the door. Confess your sins. God's a holy God, and God loves you, and God expects holiness, and so confess your sins at the door. That's the second C. The third C is consecration, um, which is the preaching of the word. Okay? The fifth C is communion, taking communion, fellowship with the body, communion um, that our Lord Jesus Christ called us to. And the last one is the commissioning. The going out, the sending out, the benediction. So that's our way in the CRAC of kind of constructing our worship. I think it's really important. This can seem like, wait, I thought this was about liberty. That's right. And, and Gabe just went on this, like, I don't know, theology tangent. And, and like Dr. Wright was saying, people click on this channel and say, what? W-U-T? <laughs> what? what? <laughs> How do you pronounce that? <laughs> what? <laughs> and, but, but here's the thing. Um, about, I mean, for, for centuries, God's people understood um, that when you gather before God, um, you ought not to just come and offer whatever you think. You ought not make it up as you go along. You're Strange not, fire. You don't wing it uh, when you come before the living God. When you recognize fundamentally, I didn't make myself, God made me, he is the creator, um, they're, they're, the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. And so you, there's a, it should be joyful, but it's a joyful trembling. And what, what Gabe's getting at is the fact that um, we in the church, we, we, stopped, we stopped trembling. We stopped, fear, I, mean, That's how, right. I mean, how many times do you see a church website where you say, come here, we fear the Lord? Toby? They don't say that. Toby? How does a bag of fizzing chemicals yeah. worship God? Yeah. Okay. That's, that's the gulf right. that people aren't... But I, think the, but I think the answer is, is actually Psalm 100, which we sang earlier, right? We didn't make ourselves. Right. That's right. Exactly. And, and, and I think that's a bare minimum. I think you're right. I mean, they're being catechized all day long. You're all a bag of fizzing chemicals. Your life is meaningless. Might makes right. Survival to the fittest. Darwinianism through and through. Um, but the Bible also says that the invisible attributes of God are clearly seen by all those who have been made. 
They know there is a God. They know he made all things. And I think it's our job to say, therefore you are called to worship him, acknowledge him, thank him. And, and again, the thing that we're pushing towards is, I think in the church, one of the ways we failed, one of the ways we lost all this ground in our land, which I don't think we sometimes connect, is we started making worship all about serving ourselves, making it That's feel right. good, That's having right. an emotional orgasm, right? When the, when the cord hits and everybody's hands go up. Ah! And the lights are off. <laughs> right? You know that part? Right? And then, but it's all about this emotional hit. It's not about obedience to God. And, you, and then you wonder why we're catechized. I mean, you've got millions of professing Christians, millions of Christians that go to church Sunday after Sunday, but what they're being catechized in is emotionalism. It's, right. in, it's in, in feelings. And then you wonder why they think, well, I just, I feel bad. I feel so bad about telling my, my cousin or my, my brother or my son who, you know, he, he says he's homosexual or, or my, my daughter or my, my, my niece who wants to get an abortion, you know, I, I just feel so bad because it's so hard and everything's so emotionalized because we've turned worship into an emotional moment. It's not about actually serving the Lord. It's not actually about obeying him, bringing the sacrifice of praise that he commands. It's about doing what feels good. And then we catechize people in that. And then we wonder why they don't understand. We, we do a, a Bible reading challenge. Um, Rachel Jankovic and a few other ladies in our church started a few years ago. And, they've, and there's like now like, I don't know, like how many? 20,000. Like 30, I mean, yeah. there are tens of thousands of women uh, on this Facebook group, you know, that are reading the Bible, many for the very first time. And every year, like, as they're reading through the Bible, you've got like thousands of thousands of women. My wife's on this group and she says, they're asking questions again, like Jesus didn't really say that, did he? Ezekiel said, what? And, and like, yeah, that's real. But it's like, because for many, many of these evangelical Christians, they go to church for an emotional hit. And, and that's it. That's all that, for them, that's all that what being a Christian is. We've evolutionized our worship to fizzy chemicals. Yeah, we're a bunch of fizzing you know. chemicals. But again, the point is, is that you can't have an ordered freedom. You can't have an ordered society that respects boundaries that says, oh, I'm a civil magistrate. What somebody's doing with their body is none of my business. What, what some, you know, the, the, the health decisions they want to make is none of my business. My job is to punish evildoers. You can't have that kind of obedience in a civil magistrate if you're not teaching that kind of obedience in worship. That's the bottom line. And, and what you're doing when you're faith, faithfully worshiping God, he's working in you to will and to do for his good pleasure. That, that's what's happening ultimately in worship is God is working in you. you. You are submitting yourself to him and God turns around and works in you and changes you. And you aren't trying to line up your emotions for an experience. You're trying to line up what you're doing to give God the glory and he works into you to will and to do for his good pleasure. And inside of that, it answers the question, what Dr. White is getting to, the point of why people are so lost from this to over here. Like, how do they jump that gap? Well, in worship, it, does, it sets out what a man is and what he's for and who his God is and how is he to live before his God. Yeah. If we don't get that ordered right, then when we talk to people about the metaphysical realities of a man and a woman, we get it wrong on the application of that. Right. Once we set worship in place, you were a man designed to be the image bearer of God. He placed man in a garden to keep it and to protect it. He gave him a wife for wisdom to learn how to take that garden and make it the rest of the world, and turn the rest of the world into that. And so we don't have worship in order, so then we get messed up on how a man is to operate in the rest of the world, even as Christians. That's why setting worship up properly makes man more human to be able to communicate those realities of people who are far off from that basic understanding let's get christians not thinking that they're fizzing bags first of all yes right. exactly let's, right. let's just Amen. get christians to understand they're made in the image of god that they were made for marriage marriage and made for child rearing right. and made for work and so on you know one of the, this actually moves us naturally right into the second um smooth stone which is confession of sin which i, I don't i think could, again can also seem like kind of a strange thing like what planet are you from um, but i think this is actually connected to the point you're making is that um one of the gifts of god is actually the dignity of guilt. Uh, and I don't think we think about that sometimes, but like, I think this is one of the failures of our prison system. Uh, you, you, have, you have, you know, just that the, there's no actual um, dealing with actions. You, you are made in the image of God. You're responsible for your actions. You're a free agent. 
you have choices, you make choices, and that includes then the dignity of guilt. That you did something wrong, now go make it right. right. You did this, you're guilty before God, before those you wronged, but we live in a, in, a, in a church, frankly, much less a nation and a culture that doesn't want anybody to be guilty of anything. Everybody else is to blame everybody else. Everything else, you know, it's, it's, it's my family, it's my culture, it's, I didn't have a dad, I, I, you know, I was abused. It was all these things. And yeah, we live in a fallen world and there's frequently a lot of sin to go around. But, but what, what we teach and what the, what the gospel brings is the dignity that, yeah, you're made in the image of God. You have the ability to make choices. And when you make those, you make wrong choices, sometimes you, you're, you're guilty then. Yeah. And you need, to, you need to confess those things and make them right. And that makes you more human. Right. <laughs> Confessing. Your That's sin. the thing that people can't understand. Yeah. It's like actually being, being, having the dignity of being human means you're a moral agent. Like what you do actually matters in the world. But if you say, no, 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 that wasn't your fault. That wasn't yeah, your fault. Yeah. That wasn't your fault. Over and over again, eventually what you're saying is, and actually you don't do anything worth anything. Right. How yeah. was David's authority restored after sinning with Bathsheba? Psalm 51. He confessed his sins. And when he confessed his sins, he asked God that you'd restore me so that I can go tell sinners your way. This, this comes all the way back to the home. The home is a great place to, to understand these concepts and to see how they work out from there to the rest of society. When I look at my home, the thing that mucks up my home more than anything else is sin. <laughs> you know, there's this, that's, that's just the engine that drives culture, and I believe it is part of the engine that drives culture. The confession of sin is the lubricant that keeps the engine running smoothly. Sin comes in, mucks up everything, slows everything down. Things don't function properly. And we need to come and confess our sins to each other. Mom, I was wrong. I should have did the dishes. I didn't do the dishes. Will you forgive me? Yes, honey, I forgive you. Mom, I was disobedient. I, I didn't do what you told me to do. Will you forgive me? Yes. And then go and do it. And then the responsibility of the parent is to let their kids know that's it. It's over. Your sins are, conf are confessed. There's nothing else over you. No more guilt. No That's more right. shame. You're it's done. over. And so you know where to take the guilt and shame too. You take it to the cross. Yep. And so confession of sin is like, okay, we do have something that's on us, but there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, Amen. right? And so when we see confession of sins, we need to train our children to confess their sins, keep small accounts so that we don't muck up the machine of the family and so that we can worship together in communion. And the things that need to get done, like David Reese was talking about, the work, the work gets done so that the family and the home operates well. That doesn't just happen there. You take that to your companies. Companies that see Christians who confess their sins, take responsibility for their sins and say, I wasn't here on time. Forgive me. That won't happen again. I didn't do this job right. I'm the person responsible. Forgive me. I won't do that anymore. And owns that. They're looking for those kind of people because we know where the problem is and it's fixed. And so we can move forward. But when no one takes responsibility, no one confesses their sin, we're sitting here saying, well, we have a break in the system and we don't know how to fix it. And so confession of sin is a essential tool of how liberty operates. And this, yeah. this is one of the ways that you can clap. You can clap. Whoa, don't, don't worry about I'll interrupting me. I'll give myself a little. Hey. Did and you this, give yourself an organ? I did. I did. I gave myself a little organ. Whoa. Oh. And this is one of the ways where the world wants to control you. This is one of the ways where the liberals try to control us. Is because they start shouting, you're hateful, you're racist. They start shouting all these sins at you. They want to heap that guilt on you. The world wants to heap that guilt on you, and then you start getting levers on you. You start getting maneuvered. Sin, sin, unconfessed sin is a lever in your life. And that lever in your life is what moves you and can put you in various corners that you never would have ended up in if you would have initially confessed your sin in the beginning. David mentioned the, the word short accounts. Kids, kids in this room, marriages in this room. Oh yeah, I can't. I can't tell you when I um, started going to Christ Church and Pastor Wilson started ta talking about keeping short accounts and how that's been such a blessing in my marriage over the 17 years. I think I've been married 17 years. So thank you, David. Over <laughs> over the 17 years that I've been married is to keep short accounts with your wife, uh, children. Learn the exercise of what it means to keep short accounts in your own sin in your own lives. When you sin, confess it to God. 
When you sin against your brother, go confess it to your brother. Make it quick. And this is one of the areas you know where you're lacking faith is when you don't keep short accounts. Because you don't believe that forgiveness is there for you. You don't believe that, that Jesus is waiting for you to come to you, That's to right. come to him to ask for forgiveness of your sins. Because guess what? Like David said, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Go to him and confess your sins. Keep short accounts. That's such a blessing. I think, I think, and I think, again, the practical out, out, outworking of this, I mean, this is obviously practical in the family, the practical in, in businesses, but I mean, we are seeing the fruit in the public square of failure to understand this gift, that if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. The gift Amen. of forgiveness, Amen. the dignity of guilt and the gift of forgiveness, and it works itself all the way out. I mean, I can't help but think of, again, this, this conversation we're having all around abortion and the, the, uh, the moral agency of a woman. I mean, what, what, the, what the culture is trying to do is actually erase the dignity of a woman. That's right. In, right. in the right. name of empowering them, which, by the way, every time they say we want to empower women, you need to now think to yourself, that means they want to strip all of their glory from them and then sell back the rags as cool, fun, and Ooh. sexy. Um, but, the, but, the, but that's what they're doing. They're, they're, they're destroying, erasing the dignity of a woman who's made in the image of God, uh, made with the, the potential of the glory of being a mother. And I mean, we were, uh, you know, all this, this uh, pushback about the, the Roe leak, you know, the potential that Roe is going to be overturned, this Alito opinion and everything, and the, the liberals lighting their hair on fire, screaming, you know. And it's like, it's hilarious when you listen to them talk. It's like, apparently women, like, just, like, get pregnant, like, randomly. Right. <laughs> like, we don't know how it happens. What? It's like it's, it's like just like a, you know, inclement weather or getting the flu or something. It's like, just happens. And so if, if you take away the right of a woman to kill her baby... Uh, like you're destroying her, her personhood and you think, no, 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 stop. No, no you're destroying her personhood by, talk, by, by acting like she doesn't make choices about what she's doing, yeah. about, about who, you know, who she's sleeping with, who she's married to. And, and, and I think even as, as we're talking about it, right, in, in our culture today, what, what people try to do, particularly the left says, it's not enough for you to confess your sins, you have to take on the sins of people who look like you <laughs> Come on now. 250 years ago. Yeah. Mm. And, and that's part of what we need to, to resist. So, yes, confess your sins in, in your home to your wife or to your husband that's right. or to your parents Come or to now. your children. Yeah. But never take on the sins of another as if they are your own mm. just because you share <laughs> some common characteristics. So, I mean, and... and and then when you do it and you believe God for forgiveness, walk as a free man or, fr or free woman in Christ. Not, not with your head held down and not with somebody saying, well, you, you confess your sin for your great granddad, but what about your great great granddad? It's like, <laughs> sorry, Joe, we're not doing that today. So you can go get another sucker and make him feel guilty and make him empty his pockets. But I'm, I'm free in Christ. And I will, after I, I believe what Christ did at the cross, it is finished. It's been accomplished. Yes. Amen. Yes. You can't hang anything back on me. Amen. Jeff, Jeff, did you have something? Yeah, well, I think just in, in light of recent circumstances, and I promise I do talk about other things besides abortion, but this is... Uh, <laughs> no, you it's okay. I promise, no, you I, promise it's okay. I do. Um, it's, it's just uh, it's a waiting moment because of where we're at and, and where, what's coming in the next couple of weeks. Uh, and this goes back to the original point about worship. If, if it's all about worship, it's, it's all about an ultimate. Who gets the glory? Who do we sacrifice to? So who, <clears throat> the question is, who has the final say? It was interesting. Uh, we were in Louisiana a, a couple times over the last two months. Some of you guys may have seen some of the footage. Um, I think two different, we have two different pieces of content that went out where we were sort of engaging with some protesters at our rally. And then also we, we did a little bit of evangelism and, and talking to people at, at LSU. And uh, you'll hear it come up a few times, uh, something like, keep your religious laws out of the public square, or keep your <laughs> religious laws off my body. Or like several times in the video we dropped yesterday, you can hear the women, and I think some of the guys, say something like, stop bringing your religion into this. Stop bringing your religion into this. And, and the funny thing was, is like, I kept, you'll hear me say to them, you're very religious. 
you are very religious. Now, I'm not just trying to turn the tables on them. They don't see it. Right. That, that when, when they talk about why are you making this about religion, and then they go and tell me what is the ultimate, is the woman in society, and what we say, this is our ethical system, and this is our ultimate. It's like, I want to say to them, that's amazing. We're both trying to do the same thing. Only right. mine's oh, Jesus. <laughs> right. You have a God. Yes. You have right. a God. You have a religion. I'm just, Preaching, man. I'm being more overt Right. And honest with mine, you're pretending neutrality, but only for moments in the conversation. But when, when it comes to the issue of confession of sin, it's interesting because it, it is a trademark of biblical faith that there is an ultimate and there is an ultimate standard by which we are all to be tested. And so you can see that flowing through scripture where even all the heroes of the faith will get jammed up with their own sin and then confronted with the ultimate and his standard. So you talk about David. David's a perfect example where here, here he's supposed to be like this high prestigious position. Like, let's just yield to the president, y'all. Like, I mean, you know, don't say anything. The I mean, Supreme wanna, Court said so, We want to keep our jobs. I mean, come on. I mean, you know, it's, it's just a Bathsheba. It's just one instance. I mean, just keep your mouth shut. But no, a godly man comes to him and says, hey, let me tell you a story real fast. Here's a story, and David's like, say what? And he goes, yeah, right. it's you. Right. Yeah. You are the and man. He, and he does that on the basis of this is the law, word of God. You're supposed to be the king. You're supposed to obey God. You didn't. And so what's David do? He gets confronted with his sin. He repents. Everybody knows about his repentance, confesses sin, and then there's healing after that. We've come to a point because we reject God and his word, and God is the ultimate. Our society says, no, we want our religion and ultimate, our ethical standards set up. And their ethical standards, essentially, it's amazing, tell them that you're never wrong. Yeah. You don't like your penis? Cut it off. You're not wrong for that. You want to become a man? Do something about it. Take, take, the, take these hormones. Take this medication. You're not wrong for what your passions are. You're never wrong for your passions. And so when someone says, well, I'd rather have sex in this way, our society says, well, our God says it's okay. Our ethical system says it's okay. And as a matter of fact, you should never feel guilty about fulfilling your lust and your passion. So our society says you should never feel guilty. And that goes all the way across. So you see it even during COVID, the whole situation with COVID. Because we don't have God, as the ultimate standard, because we won't obey Jesus Christ and God's word, we don't want to ever admit that we're wrong because there's no standard above us by which to measure us. And so when they failed over the last two years with COVID, with tyranny and treacherous acts and arrests and abuse and all kinds of things that were just sinful and evil, even when they are dem demonstrably wrong, right. and you could say, here's all the scientific data over your stupid face diapers. <laughs> yeah. Right? They, they will never say because they cannot be guilty, because they cannot, fess, they cannot confess wrong, we were wrong. Please forgive us. We're going to do better. They can't do like David did because they're the ultimate. They're their own ethical system. Yeah. And when it comes to anything across the board, whether you talk about, you know, this, this gets deep, the issue of like supply chain and, and, and baby formula and gas prices, you know, they can never be wrong. There's no guilt because there's no standard above us, no ethical system above us. We'll define the rules and we'll do it day by day by day. We'll it's shift also, it. And it's also because they have, they have no way out. I mean, I mean right. if, you, if, if they actually are confronted with their sin, they, they're condemned and they have no sacrifice. Right, no, which is why they have to avoid it. Yeah, they have to avoid so it. So that's why they're never wrong. There's no forgiveness. It's not my fault. The supply chain is not my fault. This is not my fault. It's his fault. Right. It's your fault. And that's what right. sinners do is they always try to, uh, to free themselves from their guilt and shame by saying, it's your fault. Right. And I'll just end on this point. It's seen supremely. And I hope it's a good current example to point to in terms of how the church can work in this. In the issue that happened in Louisiana, the entire establishment moved, not the pro-choice establishment, pro the entire pro-life establishment yep. moved against our bill and they worked so hard. I could tell you stories. I could name names right now, but I don't even think it would affect their careers. And it should. People that you know, trust me, you think they're heroes. They specifically called our legislators to tell them to don't pass the bill. Mm. Um, but it goes to what, what happened there is the main point they were making in terms of don't pass that. Is it true? Yes. Do you believe it? Yes. Should it be done? Yes. They all said that. But they said, don't pass it. Why? Because she's not guilty. She can never be guilty. Right. 
You can't say that she's guilty for killing her child. We don't ever want her to be seen as guilty for killing her child. And so what was the main thing there is all about worship. Yeah. Yeah, right. Because we won't say what God says about it so she can actually be forgiven in Jesus. Right. We won't yeah, actually right. honor a woman, give her the dignity of an image bearer. Yes. Confessing sin. Uh, a moral agent no. who yeah. has the power to make choices that life and death are in her hands. Yeah. And to be able to be forgiven. Amen. So what I've been saying, and I've been trying to stress this to ministers of the gospel, is say, brothers, the thing we tell women in our counseling rooms is that Jesus can forgive you of that. You can be washed. You can be justified. Yeah. You can take that sin to him. He'll forgive you. He'll cleanse you. That's what we say to our sisters in Christ in that room. But what we're being asked now is we're being asked to deny that the cross applies to this. Because she's not guilty. She can never be guilty. We don't want to just right. say, it's okay to confess your sin. Right. There's forgiveness in this. Which is, which is us saying, we do not women, want women to be free. Right. That's right. That's what we're saying. That's we right. don't want them to actually be free. That's right. Um, I want to Knox, are you trying to say something? No, 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 no. I was just wondering what James was thinking. <laughs> My fellow pastor is preaching. I, I get okay. I get All right. I, I got I got one more metaphor before you turn the corner here. Real one quick. more this metaphor. Is, this is for I, I, this is uh, I wish I had known this metaphor when I was a younger kid. Um, so I'm speaking to, particularly to the kids again, okay? Because kids are here. We love kids. Um, when you don't confess small little sins, it's like a ship leaving the dock one degree off, and then you wonder 20 years down the road why you're so off from your relationship with Jesus Christ is because you started with one small sin going unconfessed and that grew and grew to bigger sins going unconfessed and it grew and grew to bigger and bigger sins going unconfessed. So humble yourself. Humble yourself before God. And, and what happens? He lifts you up. Yeah, yeah. And over, over 20 years of you confessing your sins, um, you're learning, you're gaining strength in what it means to fight sin in your own life. So, yeah. so children, confess your small sins now. Yeah. And don't let you get one degree off now because in 20 years you're going to wake up and be like, what happened? Right. Yeah. The reason why Christians are not leading in this country in the way they should be is because they haven't confessed their sins. They're, they're not clean. They don't have that no condemnation. They don't, they're not walking away from the cross, heads held high, yeah. leading, saying, you got nothing on me. Jesus knows it all. It's all been forgiven. Right? That's, that's where freedom comes yeah, from. Yeah, yeah. Amen. Uh, you giving me the sign now? Let's, let's turn the corner. The sign has got to get out of here by 10. Okay. The third smooth stone for taking down giants of tyranny is discipleship. And, um, and I think I want to I frame this as thinking about um, teaching the world what reality is. Remember the, the Great Commission, all authority in heaven and on earth been has been given to Jesus. And he said on the basis of that, because all authority in heaven and on earth, which means all authority in our homes, all authority in our churches, all authority in our state houses, all authority in the Supreme Court, all authority has been given to him. And he said, therefore, go disciple the nations, teaching them to obey everything that Jesus has commanded. And of course, baptizing them and their babies. Um, <laughs> one of the, um, <laughs> the debate has begun. Um, I, I, I can't, can, can you find that in there, Jeff? I don't see that in there. No. But Stop the, looking at my notes. You didn't email that to me, I promise. <laughs> the, uh, the promise is to you and to your children. Oh, and there you go. all those oh, in the Lord your God. Amen. Yeah, Let's baptize them. Everyone who was no, baptized now he woke those up. who heard well, We've been talking the about three tools of liberty, and it took <laughs> baptism before you decided to say, wait a no, second. No, it's, it's, the, it's the Presbyterian partial citation of Acts 2.38 oh, that woke okay. me up. That woke you up. All right. <laughs> there all right. we go. Dr. White's back. All right. Welcome back. <laughs> He's awake. Welcome back. Um, but I think the thing that I, I want to really, I, I want to drill down on here again is, is that we, the church has failed to teach. Yes. The church has failed to disciple. You had one job. <laughs> right? I mean, literally, like we had one job. Disciple the nations. Teach them everything that's in the Bible. That's, that was the job. Except for the Old Testament, because that wasn't in the Old Testament. There's no disciple in nations. No, 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 Gabe. When Jesus gave the command, all they had was the Old Testament. That's right. <laughs> I, was, I was just playing. You, you were wrong. I was playing the devil advocate. <laughs> um, so you'd be opposed to unhitching it. I would be very opposed <laughs> right. to unhitching That's it. That's right. Yes. Um, and, and, and I think, again, this is one of those, those places where um, we, we cannot underestimate what we have done here 
not only did we turn worship into emotional hour and sharing hour and comedy hour and everything except obeying God hour, everything except teaching everything that God has commanded hour, um, but that has had long like downstream effects. Um, even again, back to, you know, what's wrong with conservatism? What's wrong with people who call themselves conservatives? And then and you say, okay, so what should we do about immigration? What should we do? I mean, what is a biblical um, standard for taxation? We should build a wall. <laughs> right, right. And it was like, you know, we talked to one. That's as deep as we get. We, well, we talked to wall. We talked to one lady one time and, and, on, on Cross Baltic, and, and she said, well, in Nehemiah, they built a wall. Yeah, that's right. That's <laughs> right. right. And I was like, well, kudos for citing the Bible. <laughs> right, yeah. All right, we can work with that. We like, can work with that. That's a good start. Yes. <laughs> like, I want to get a little deeper than that, but, like, but we can't even get, I mean, cons- we can't even get conservatives to say the Bible says we, we, we can't even get conservatives to say that. Um, and, but that is our job, is to disciple the nations. Um, so here, I'm going to give a crazy example of a place where I think we, we, need to, we need to work. We have our work cut out for us. I think most Christians are actually, uh, uh, I'll say that, uh, most Christians, that's overstating it. I'm being too generous. Most, most, um. most Christians in this room, <laughs> okay. conservative Christians, um, who are listening to this podcast or watching this show probably have a pretty good grasp of the fact that our standard for truth and goodness, truth and morality, must be grounded in Scripture. I, I think most Christians understand that, that our ultimate standard of truth and goodness is grounded in Scripture. But here's the place where we, we flop, is um, when it comes to beauty. And all of a sudden, a bunch of Christians turn into a bunch of flaming relativists. Well, who's to say what's beautiful? I I like that song. I like that painting. I like that movie. I like that story. And what we but that's actually how we got here. Relativism got into the church starting with the relativization of beauty. So here's here's a here's an example. I was I read an article actually by our friend um, Jason Whitlock Whitlock, on the on the Blaze. Um, and um, uh, responding to maybe some of you saw the Twitter, uh, I don't know, what do you call it? Blow up? Yeah, with Jordan sure. Peterson. Fluffle with Jordan Peterson, where um, apparently, I, I don't follow these things, but apparently there is a, uh, a Sports Illustrated swimsuit uh, model. They're releasing all their covers right now for the year. Okay. I, and I Elon Musk's mom is going to be on one. Oh, dead yeah. serious. You're kidding. I'm dead serious. 75 year old. I didn't need to know that, Gabe. Yeah. I didn't need to know that. Um, but apparently, I'm, one, just, I'm just adding to the conversation. That's all. Apparently, I am told that on one of these covers is a, is a very large Asian woman. Um, and, and Jordan Peterson had um, the audacity uh, to, to share this on Twitter and say, This woman is not beautiful. And the Twitterverse exploded, as you might imagine. And, um, and, and, and this is, but this is, but our, our friend, uh, Jason Whitlock, he, he wrote an article about this that I read this morning where he said, um, you know, actually, I think, I think, uh, Jordan Peterson is, is wrong in this. He should have said that this, this is unhealthy because obesity is unhealthy. It's not good for you, which is true enough. But, but I, I actually think Jason, if I talk to you, um, I think, I think, um, Peterson was spot on. It isn't beautiful, and part of the reason it's not beautiful is because uh, it's not healthy. She's dehumanizing herself with her. Exactly. But there's a, a, a t- t- explain the, 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 what was the other yeah, there's meme a, there's you a, saw? There's, a, there's another uh, Calvin Klein photo going around with the three images. One of the images, a woman in a bikini. Slender. Like 1999 or something. Right, right, from 1999. The second image is a black lady who's overweight, who's sitting in Calvin Klein stuff. It's like 2009 yeah, or 2009. something Yeah, like 2009. They have all have these dates on them. The last one is a picture of a woman in the bed and another woman who is on the side of the bed um, actually, yeah, yep, that's but right. has a beard on, who is presented like a man, and pregnant. Yep. And, and it says like 2022 or something like that. And so there's these three different categories, and everyone is looking at the last two and saying, oh, man, look how far we've fallen. But they've missed out on throwing a, a, a fit at the first one. 
because they misidentified the purpose and the reality of what a woman is for, and they presented a symbol of of femininity and female and what a female is wrongly, and we didn't say anything about that because because boys will be boys because it it, it it attracts our lusts and desires and uses her as a tool, but because those don't slip up to the other ones, we're like, ooh, where did we go wrong at in these two? 99 was so much better. And it's like, no, no, no. You gave up the metaphysical realities of a woman on the first one. That's right. So you get two and three and, naturally. And but to, to, to Dr. White's point earlier, actually, I think we gave up this in like whenever we, allow, we, we accepted Darwinism. I mean, when we said God is not creator, when we said, oh, that's a legitimate theory to theorize that we're meaningless matter. I mean, that, that was... Decades before, I mean, that, but that's but that's really where we gave up the argument. And but if we're meaningless bags of fizzing matter, then why can't we objectify? Why can't we depersonalize? Why can't we use and abuse and do whatever we want? Because survival of the fittest. Yeah. Delana, we were talking about yeah. this earlier. I know you got something to say. Well, I, I mean, my 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 issue with with Jordan Peterson was not his comment. Obviously, he's free to express his opinion. Is that he? But was he right? Well, my issue is <laughs> you can't you can't throw a rock and hide your hand. So you can't insult someone and then complain that other people are are yeah. you know uh, coming back to you, you. Yeah, yeah. And, then, yeah. and, then, and then run away. Apparently, he quit Twitter after this. Huh? Yeah, yeah. That well, you shouldn't, you sh that's true. That's true. Jordan Peterson, if you're gonna if you're gonna you gotta you're gonna stand pick up. a fight. You stand there and fight. Yeah, but, but as it relates to discipleship, I, I think about this, particularly as a, as a father with three young children. And, you know, my wife and I, we recently decided to homeschool. I was against it at first because I went to public schools for the vast majority of my life. And I said, you know, I want my kids to go to public schools because I want them to be street smart. And then I, I started to think about it. What positive like socialization that I get from public school. I mean, I learned how to shoot dice and do other, you know, stuff like that. But, um, but eventually, you, you know, God started to, to work on my heart and I, and I started to, to grow my faith and understand that education is equal part scholarship and discipleship, right? It's academic mastery and moral formation. That's right. And when you give your children over to people who hate your biblical values, and then you wonder why you, you send your 10-year-old daughter. She likes to play with her brother. She likes to play basketball, right? You know her in the houses. You know, that's Tina the tomboy. Three years in her public school, and she comes back, and she says, I'm now a boy named Tom. And you're wondering, how did she get that way? Yeah. yeah. That's because she's been discipled right. by people who tell her, to your point, mm. you, you're just, you know, a bag of matter. So... You can be whatever you, you want to be. You be, be whatever you want to be. So you can, it, it's gone so crazy. It's like you say, okay, you're a girl, so you can be a boy. And now that's become passe. So there's some people who say, well, I'm neither girl or boy. I'm non-binary. And I'm saying to myself, look, if you get old enough, <laughs> when you're a dude and you're 40 or 50 years old and you have to wake up every five hours to, to get up in the middle of the night and go to the bathroom, that process <laughs> is telling you exactly who you are. Right? So there's, there's no mistake in whether you are, you know, a, a, a You're a there male. already? Right. Okay. No, no, I'm not, I'm not there. I'm not there. <laughs> All right. All right. I'm not there. But, but, but really what it is is, and, and even you see... The, the 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 church. <laughs> uh, Dr. White, you, you need to never mind. Nah. <laughs> we love you, Dr. White. But 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 this this goes back to you know what we were talking about with confession of sin and, and worship. Even the church's foot is starting to slip in some places where now you have conservative, the theologically conservative pastors talking about pronoun hospitality. Yeah. Because right. we're starting to give away the game as it relates to God's truth. Oh, wow. We're not talking about, you know, complicated matters. This is Genesis 127. You, you can't throw a stone in the Bible and, and, and not hit these things. That's so, the pre previous president of the SBC, J.D. Greer, who was saying that. Cor I mean, correct. That's how, that's how big this is. Right. Yeah, so, so, so my, my encouragement is parents, understand what your children are learning, and particularly fathers, do not give away your responsibility to train and raise your children Amen. to anyone else. Amen. Right? Yeah, Stand yeah. up for God's truth. Um, Jay, we got, we got, I'm opening we got, up to my other pastor. I'm just, uh, you want to say something, Pastor James? No? Okay. I, I wanna, I'm going to add to this. I, I guess I want to bring it back. I'm not, I'm not, we got 20 minutes and we need to change. <laughs> what? We got two corners. Yep. Well, I just want to finish with this thing. 
And that is, Delano is exactly right. And again, back to, this is a kind of a theme we keep hitting, is um, the glory of a woman is her beauty. That's right. That, that's, that's what, that's God, God made her to, to be the glory of man. And so we don't define beauty as a woman in bikini. Yeah, right. we, we, the, the beauty of a woman is, is in her, I mean, it, there is a physical beauty, but it's, it's, right. to be, it's driven by her gentle, quiet spirit. It's driven by her submission and her fear of the Lord. She adorns herself differently. Yes, and, and then particularly in the way that she cultivates life in her own body as a mother, and then as she cultivates that life in her home, um, that glory is beautiful. And the last thing I want to say about that, though, is, is I think, again, as conservatives, a lot of times we, we major on truth and goodness, what is true and what is moral. And frequently, we do have, have no idea what is beautiful. And that makes us completely um, incapable of being persuasive. Christians should be at the Thank forefront you. of winning arguments because we have the best stories, yep. That's because right. we are the That's best right. artists, because we are the best musicians, because we know the God who made this place, and he made this place beautiful. And our art is to mimic and imitate that objective beauty, to lift people up and to be winsome. And, and again, to your point, Dr. White, when people look and they think, man, this is weird. These people are from another planet. Sometimes the thing that breaks through, I mean, obviously we lead with the gospel, we lead with the gospel story, but sometimes the thing that really does break through though is the beauty of holiness. They see a marriage where a man really loves his wife and his wife is, is so into her husband. And they see children loved. I, can, I, I think sometimes about, we lived in South Carolina when I went to seminary for a couple of years and we lived in this apartment complex. And, you know, it was just the little things. We lived on the ground floor outside the, the play area. And every night, my kids were little, like two and one. But every night, my wife would make dinner and we sat down and ate dinner together. And we, we sometimes had to call the kids in or I'd be outside with the kids for a minute and we'd go and sit down. And then almost every time, we have these, the, like all the kids in the neighborhood, they'd come up to the balcony, to the porch, and they'd be looking over. See it. And yeah. you see like little ha ha faces. Look at, and, and I, like, I really think that many of them had never seen yep. a family sitting down eating dinner together. I think that many of them, many of them were from single mom houses. Um, it, it, was a, it was a lower middle class uh, neighborhood. And, you know, and every once in a while my wife would go out and be like, do you guys want to bite? And give them little bowls of like, you know, our soup or whatever we were having for dinner and everything. But just like watching, like looking over the thing. And I, I still remember that. I think, you know, in some ways the, the depravity of this world, which is so, it's so horrible. And at the same time, God has lowered the bar so much. <laughs> It's right. like, love your wife. Like, show them the beauty of the gospel in your marriage, in your family, in your kids, together. That beauty <clears throat> wins. It really will That's win. That's right. That's right. I've Amen. eaten at your house. Yeah, you have. I have. It was awesome. We had pizza. You're, yes. Your wife introduced me to uh, Tillamook Mudslide, I think it was. The ice cream. Yes, I gained like 10 pounds two yeah. months after that because I just kept buying it. You were welcome. <laughs> so tell her I said you were thank welcome. you. You're welcome. Amen. And then uh, I've eaten at your house as well, and, but not yours because you hate me, I guess. So, <laughs> um, well, I want to say just you missed just, that text. I know, I know we're almost, we got to go quick here. Just two things. In terms of discipleship of the nations, like we think about our churches and what we're saying to the world around us, I think there's two important things to point to, and that is that, of course, what is the standard that we're discipling them with? And then the other question that has to be answered to, and understood by the church is what are the consequences? So what is the standard and what are the consequences? I think one of the major challenges right now we have to face as the evangelical church or the church in the West is that we have to nail down those two things and understand them and be prepared for them. So for example, when we are like you're saying, what's beautiful, what's true, what's lovely, what ought to be the case, what is the right law, what is justice. You've got Christians in the world today who are who just love to stand up in the public square and say, yeah, I care about social justice too. Look, God does hear, God does hear, God does hear. He commands people to care about it. And they, they have a point. Right. Don't you, care about, don't you care about racial justice? God hasn't changed. They're right to quote those verses. God is a God of justice. He cares about justice in the public square. And so they're winning on the fact that, hey, 
God says we actually ought to do something about this, but they're losing in the discipleship area because they do not believe God's law is a standard. That's right. So they just go like everyone else, willy-nilly and arbitrary, and say this, make it up as they go along. Which usually is socialism. It's socialism. It's, it's no different than a Marxist who's just as arbitrary. It's, it's now a, a Christian who is also arbitrary, but they have one key thing. God cares about justice. They're right about that. But then they don't have a standard by which they can disciple the nations. Into that, so yeah. what is the standard that has to be finally answered by the church? Amen. What are you standing on? Is it going to be the law word of God or isn't it? Is it going to be you and your own interpretations and your That's own right. decisions? Or is it going to be God's actual standard? Amen. That God of justice had a lot to say about what actually is just. Amen. So the right. second point is, what's this, what is what are the consequences? This goes back to like a major problem. Dr. White wrote a book years ago called Pulpit Crimes. And I think it's, <laughs> you didn't even know I knew that, did you? Um, so... <laughs> Do you remember Just that you kidding. wrote that book? Uh, did you know? I, I, I re- recall it very clearly. Yes. <laughs> so, but, but there's, there's in this, again, discipleship of the nations. Okay, if you don't get the question of what's the standard right, we're not going to disciple anybody rightly. But the, what are the consequences? The evangelical church in the West is so consumed with being loved by the culture, being liked by the culture. So they say stupid things like, foolish things like, well, let's, let's, be, let's be polite to their pronouns. No, reject it. Call it, to, call it down to repentance. Yeah. Bring it to the issue of the word of God. Talk about Christ. Make it about the gospel. Make it about God's authority. So like, you know, years ago, you heard the story about like, you know, uh, Rick Warren, Saddleback Church, that before he planted the church, he went around to the neighborhood, interviewing the neighborhood wow. and asking the neighbors, what do you want to see in a church? Wow. I want to ask people what they want to see in God's That's worship. That's just like Jesus. Didn't he come yeah, and right. ask us all what we... So no. uh, what are the consequences? A man like that and men like that that build church Churches like that, they haven't really actually settled themselves on the consequences of being a follower of Jesus Christ. That's right. That if you're going to disciple the nations, you're going to say things that they're going to make them vilify you. They're going to hate your guts. Right. You're going to say things that are going to have people come into your congregation and they're not going to like your church. Why? Because you're saying things that they're not comfortable with. They don't like that. But that's what discipleship's about. Sometimes pastors have to sit in counseling sessions with men and women they love, and they have to say something that might offend them. They're doing it because they're trying to shepherd them and disciple them right. according to God's word. We have to actually settle ourselves as pastors and as men and women to say, am I ready for the consequences? Like to actually say to the nations, no, these are God's standards. No, that's not beautiful. No, that's not true. No, that's not good because it's going to come with a hack of a lot of consequences. And I think that where we're at today, we're Pastor James has said all the time, one of the main things he says is we love our comforts. We love our comforts more than anything else. We're not willing to actually suffer because we would rather just be comfortable. Yeah, yeah. That's so good. It hurts. So, so I'm going to pull a water boy here. Hold on, yes. I'm going to let James speak first, and then I'm going to pull a water boy. I was just going to let Jeff know that I just got a notification from Andy Stanley that your invitation to speak has been rescinded. <laughs> Wait, he got an invitation? Yeah, well, it was, it was How did you get an invitation? That <laughs> was confusing. Um, so uh, the, the first three stones that we've talked about is worship, confession of sin, discipleship, and taking responsibility is the fourth. And I'm going to summarize this because I want to spend the last 10 minutes on the fifth. Okay. So taking responsibility has been something that men particularly have been called to and have given away. We've given away our responsibility to educating our kids to to the government. We've given away our responsibility to provide for our uh, mom and dads um, who are retired and need help. Facts. Um, After, uh, in in 1990, in 1965, 67, uh, 68, legislation came through, you know, 64, 65 legislation came through uh, on on social uh, security, si- social security and welfare, then uh, um, be the result of that legislation, um, the elderly uh, uh, there's an increase in elderly care in elderly homes by 700 percent in the following three years. So what happened was the government said, "Hey, we'll take care of your mom and dad who are retiring," and guess what? Son did. Cool. Cool. Yeah. 700 percent increase. In three years. So we've given away responsibilities for far too long. And as David hit it so hard, if you, if you take responsibility, God will give you more. This is the only way to be free. This is the only way to have liberty here um, is by taking the responsibility that God has given you by, by his, through his grace is by taking responsibility. And that's how you become free is taking responsibility. And we saw the 
we saw the consequences of that move. We handed off the responsibility to the state to take care of our parents. And then what happened in COVID? I mean, what were the, what were the percentages of the deaths of those in nursing homes? Yep. Right? Governor, Governor Cuomo? Like, turns out, if you don't obey God, curses fall. That's right. I mean, I, I had to go with my own wife to visit her grandparents in Maryland. And the best we could do was to see them through glass. So we were outside. They were brought down to the lobby, and we could see them through glass. And we were able to hand them a cell phone because cell phones don't carry COVID. <laughs> and that was the last time we saw my wife's grandparents living. Unbelievable. That's not a blessing. No. Right? That, that, that is a curse. That's and, that's, a curse. and that's because we gave that responsibility right. away. Yeah. So the last stone. The last the stone. That's, stone. That's how you're going to do it just like that. Okay, take it. responsibility, man. Take responsibility. Last one. And actually, all these things go together. It's building anti-fragile communities. Um, all of these things actually together build anti-fragile communities. Uh, anti-fragile is a, is a term that was actually coined by a man named Nassim uh, Talib, Nassim Talib, um, who's kind of a strange conglomeration of sort of Darwinian statistician, Eastern Orthodox. I don't know. COVID broke him. Yeah, I don't know. He he wasn't anti-fragile during COVID. Yeah, but but I think the principle is actually a really good common grace um, observation. And he defines what anti-fragile is, is those things which get stronger, the more they are stressed. Those things which get stronger, the more they are challenged and tested. So again, think of some of the, the, some of the examples he would give you as like your own muscles, your body. When you, when you stress your muscles, they actually get stronger. Now there's a way to overstress them and destroy them, but un, with understanding, you can stress your muscles and they actually get uh, stronger. There other, there's other materials as well that work this way. You stress them under certain conditions and they get stronger. That's anti-fragile. Um, I believe that what God has given us um, in the gospel is actually the key uh, to being anti-fragile, whether or not Nassim Tlaib even understands this. Um, Paul talks this way in Romans 8, in, in these glorious passages that talk about what can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, right? Uh, uh, famine, nakedness, sword, COVID, government tyranny, government overreach, socialism, leftists with their hair on fire, you know what? No, he says, I am convinced that in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Amen. The point he's making is actually, he says, you know, even in the midst of these things, because you cannot be separated from the love of Christ, they can only make you stronger. That's right. They Amen. can only make you better, which means Christians of all people should be the most joyful people in this moment. That's right. There's, there's no room for pessimism if you're in Christ. Because think about this, in Revelation, when John sees Jesus, there's this glorious thing. He sees Jesus, and Jesus says, look what I'm holding. He's holding the keys of death and Hades. He says, now even death and Hades, I got the keys. They serve, if you have the keys, that means you drive it. Right? I own the place now. That's right. He has the keys. Which, I mean, if if he's got the keys to death and Hades, he's got the keys to cancer, he has the keys to a broken family. He has the keys to a tyrannical government. He's got the keys to a mess, you know, all of it. He knows, he knows how to use all those things to make his people more like him. He knows how to use all those things to win. Not one of them can conquer us. We are in them more than conquerors. And so the, the real wrap up here is you think about all these stones, worship. Worship God personally, worship God in your family. Worship God publicly with God's people. Worship God the way he says to worship him, not just making it up as you go along, not just winging it, not just going in for the emotional high. Uh, What you worship, who you worship, you become like what you worship. It's either making you more human or it's deforming you and those around you. We confess our sins, why? Because that makes us anti-fragile. We know who our God is, we know that we're forgiven. There's no shame. We know who our God is. We know we're forgiven. We walk with our, hand, our heads held high. You got nothing on me. Jesus knows it all. He died for it all. I'm not afraid of you, right? Well, we're going to bring up your internet history. Oh, yeah, Jesus knows my internet history. And it's forgiven. It's under the blood. And I also confess it to my wife, so we're good, right? We're clean. I'm not afraid. You can't bring up anything on me. We're in the word. We know what God says. We're discipled. We're taking responsibility. In these ways... 
when the world comes apart, you will find that you don't, you don't have to come apart. Right. Your family doesn't have to come apart. Your church doesn't have to come apart. Um, but together, we need to build communities that won't come apart because of the place we live, the world we live in. And Jesus gave us a job to do. That's your ending music. Oh, but you, but you can finish it. Yeah, I know. Thank you. It's offering time. It's offering time? It's offering time. Oh, you know about Thank offering you time? brothers up here at hand. Thank you guys for being with us tonight. I, I did not. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Delano, Jeff. Thanks, Dr. Alice. White. Thank you. Dr. Thanks, White. Jeff. Um, yes. If you're single, get married. If you're married, have kids. And if you have kids, go baptize, go baptize them. <laughs> go baptize them. Until next time, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. <laughs> go fight, laugh, and feast. And somebody protect me from Dr. White. <laughs> this is across politics. Thank you all Thank for coming out. Thank Appreciate you, you all very much. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs>